very much. Thank you for having me. It's been a really great day. I know I'm standing between you all and either public transportation or wine or something like that, so I will stay to time. I've put my Twitter handle up there, and it's at the Bizuniverse if you want to at Bizuniverse. So Zuniverse began almost 10 years ago with this project called Galaxy Zoo, and it was very much an experiment. A graduate student named Kevin had a large problem to the tune of about a million images. He was asked to sort them into the galaxy spiral shape that you see here or the flat elliptical shape. And you couldn't really progress and start asking basic research questions of this data set until that had been done. And he was in the pub with Chris Lintott and friends, and they were wondering, could members of the public be invited to do this kind of task? And Chris appeared on the BBC Sky at Night, which is quite handy, and he said, you know, come take part in this project called Galaxy Zoo. And several thousand people showed up, and they did the work that would have taken Kevin a few years in a matter of weeks. And they not only looked at each image one time, they looked at each image about 38 times. So got very robust data for what was in each image, and then where there was a high level of disagreement in a given image, experts would then go and look at that. And sometimes there was no resolution. You know, sometimes the data had artifacts or sort of garbage, so it was not going to be well processed by an expert either. So the Zooniverse has grown into many projects, and they all have this in common. Multiple volunteers see each image or audio or video file, and they complete the tasks independently. Multiple responses are then compared and aggregated together for a single answer. So this gives us a level of confidence about what's in a given image. And then we try to reduce the number of images that experts need to look at, because if experts could go through all the data, that wouldn't really strike us as a project to put on this platform. And experts then get their raw and aggregated data to work with. Zooniverse has over 1.5 million volunteers now, and over 50 bespoke projects. So projects where we sat down with a research team or a glam organization, and we said, what are your specific needs? And I'll be coming back to how that's different from what we've been developing more recently at the end of this talk. A few of these have been mentioned today. So Notes from Nature and Science Gossip are probably of particular interest to people in this room. I'm not going to be talking about all of these projects, so you'll be delighted to hear. But I will be focusing a bit on Science Gossip and two other projects that I worked on, one of which is called Annotate and Shakespeare's World. I should say I come from an early modern literature background, and I work on convent autobiography. So all of these things are weird and wonderful to me, except for the Shakespeare's World project. But they share a common problem or a sort of point of interest, which is manuscripts, although they are increasingly machine-readable, are not really machine-readable, and inviting members of the public to take part in transcribing them is a viable option. But of course, we've already heard some notes of caution about both the process of working with the public and also that this is a form of work, and it's important to respect our volunteers. So Science Gossip asks 21st century citizen scientists to uncover the work of 19th century citizen scientists who were contributing to very eclectic periodicals. And we came to work on this project through the Constructing Scientific Communities team, which is based at Oxford and Leicester. And we paired up with the Botanical Garden in Missouri. And they said, they came to us with a biodiversity heritage library and said, we want to extract images and add more metadata and information so that the images are also searchable as well as the OCR or transcribed text that's in this vast and wonderful collection. And luckily, Jeff Belknap, who's in the audience today, was working on the kind of culture of illustration within these eclectic periodicals, and so it seemed like a nice crossroads. So we launched the project, and this is a little video, hopefully. Yeah. So you go and you mark out whether there is an image, and then you can add information to it 
not all of the different um, types of information that you see on the right are in every given uh, example. And these, um, again, get aggregated together. Interestingly, uh, we had some robust conversation on TOF, which is the discussion forum, about whether images should be automatically detected because there are a number of algorithms that can do this. And we had one very keen volunteer who wrote an algorithm one weekend and said, look, I've pulled down a bunch of examples from the Biodiversity Heritage Library website. I've automatically detected the uh, images. Why can't we just do that and just be presented with things that have images in them? But in parallel to this, we were working on another project, um, Snapshot Serengeti, which shows pictures of animals, but frequently uh, the camera traps are triggered by wind. So you just have grasses blowing across the, the screen. And although one surveyed users told us again and again that they wanted to see the pictures of the stuff they liked, the zebras and the lions and so on, in reality, um, they did more work when there were blank images presented. So we'd left uh, text-only pages in. Uh, so we periodically have a robust discussion about this, but um, we know that it, it generates more um, work and also more discussion on talk, which is the forum that you see here. Um, aggregated data, another little video. Um, this is a bit of a stopgap measure. It will all go into the Biodiversity Heritage Library eventually, but we put it up um, on a website, explorescienceGossip.org, so you can see any page from the project that's been processed already, and you can see um, the little marks, which is what the mouse is pointing to there, um, showing what individual people said, and then the square saying the image is here, and then the keywords that have been added. Um, and we keep everything, so if only one person says something, that's fine. Um, and other than it, otherwise, there, there's an aggregation there. Annotate was developing alongside this project, and this was in partnership with Tate Archives and Museums, and focused on um, the papers, whether those were sketchbooks or letters or diaries, produced by mostly 20th century British and emigre artists. Um, the goals of the project were to democratize access to, aid, to Tate Archives, which is, um, I'm sure is a common theme for many of us here today, to get people enthusiastic about these um, artists and their papers, and not just the final products, but the process that leads up to said product, um, to produce word searchable transcriptions, which will then go into the online catalog, which is being re developed as not just a place that you go to look for archival things, but where you can also go and look at objects and um, see biographies about artists and so on. So they're trying to do an all singing, all dancing search platform for their collections. And my goal coming at this from a sort of research perspective was to create a new workflow for crowdsource transcription, which um, doesn't give the white box and say transcribe what you see here, but might break it down a little bit more. Um, and one of the challenges that Chris Lincott put to me when I said I wanted to do text transcription on the Zooniverse platform in a slightly naive way um, was how are you going to make the hard tasks accessible? We know um, from papers that have been um, published by Melissa and her team and others who've worked with uh, volunteers on, on crowdsourcing and just indeed from doing some transcription uh, ourselves, it's, it's hard and you can make mistakes and it can be a lot to ask of uh, anybody, um, a volunteer, and people can also feel quite daunted, what if they make a mistake, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, micro-tasking is the way forward, but hopefully in a, in a positive way. Um, so breaking something down so that people have a way in, not micro-tasking in the sense of um, small uh, pieces of labor for a small amount of pay. Um, so the hypothesis, and it was very much a hypothesis, is that Microtasking would ask less time commitment from users, but then maybe at, like encourage them to stay longer on a project. Um, that idea was taken from gaming, what we've learned from, from gaming industry. Um, we wanted to hopefully improve data quality by mitigating against user fatigue and common mistakes such as I skip, and also to, um, for us, minimize the number of people who are seeing a given page but ensure that all of the data is captured. And we found with projects like Operation War Diary, which is another Zooniverse project, we just show a page to n number of people. And 
what typically happens is people start at the top of the page. Again, they can't see what other people have transcribed. So they, um, and they also know that other people will work on a page. So effort tends to cluster towards the top and sort of on the easier tasks. So extracting information about dates um, and place names, for example, is a bit more uh, straightforward than making an interpretive decision about whether the troops are under fire or if they're retreating or advancing or whatever the case may be. So we thought, well, we want to make sure we get everything on a page without asking 20 people to do it. I'd like to be able to ask maybe five people or three people to do a page. Uh, so this is annotate in action. So uh, this is you use a l a the dot system to select the piece of text that you want to transcribe. And you can say basic things about whether the text has been deleted or um, if there is something that's uh, not in English. Um, one of our Belgian uh, volunteers got in touch and said, I don't want it to say foreign text. And we said, right, you are. Um, so we also, of course, give uh, the opportunity for people to discuss something. Um, as, uh, you know, as with any project, you can go to what's called the talk forum and have a, have a chat about what's there. Um, mark out images, et cetera, et cetera. So some basic annotate stats. Uh, we launched in September of last year and have had about 31,000 sessions and about 110,000 classifications, so lines that have been submitted by volunteers. Um, a healthy number of registered users in terms of people who are showing up on a monthly basis is obviously going to be smaller than that, but it's, I think, a couple of hundred and um, about 10,000 fully transcribed or retired pages. And again, if we were doing it just on the sort of level of we show a page to one person and accepted that um, or had more of a mechanism for maybe individually checking each page, that number would go faster, but that's just a very different way of working than what we have developed. Um, Shakespeare's World, which is really the, the reason that I came to the Zooniverse and, and convinced them to uh, hire me, um, was a project that focuses on early modern materials, so very much my, my wheelhouse. Um, it was launched in December of last year, and um, we've had a larger number of registered users, interestingly, and a healthy number of classifications, but fewer pages are retiring. And I think what's happening is that more people are having a bit of a go at different pages and not saying, I'm done with this page, which is how we um, decide uh, it's one of the mechanisms through which we retire a page or graduate it or, or take it out of circulation. So the interface is largely the same as annotate, but there are a few more bells and whistles which are embedded to try to enable people to develop paleographical skills. Um, so in this case, uh, they can also select um, common uh, brevigraphs or abbreviations that people used in, in early modern English. And um, again, they can say whether something's unclear and under the hood, those things are in TEI. Um, we're not wedded to, to TEI, but it's a, it's a helpful standard um, that's out there. And you can also select little snippets of text if you're logged in and save them for future use, for future reference. Um, all of the folders images are uh, on, on their website. They can be used um, under Creative Commons Share Alike license, I believe. And that's also um, one of the things that's been really wonderful. So copyright uh, pretty much broke my heart with, with the Annotate project. Um, it was a really complex thing to navigate, and thankfully with, with this project, it was just much more permissive. Obviously, the material is older. Um, it's in the States, it's, so there were fewer um, challenges to overcome there, but uh, that, was, that was good. Um, so in terms of how we combine multiple independent users' transcriptions, I don't know how well you can see this, but there are some faint lines um, that run over uh, lines of text, and we've detected those using the dots that you saw earlier. So that's a clustering algorithm. It's fairly straightforward. I believe it's just something called DBCAM. And then this is uh, the transcription of the first sort of half of the page. It's pretty good. Um, I don't know how 
how many of you can read early modern handwriting with a line through it, but uh, it is, in fact, pretty good. And the only little error that um, has been made in this automated output is that the page number is in a wonky place because we haven't used DEI to say, you know, where this thing should go. We haven't we haven't done any markup to to recreate page layout because we decided that that was asking a bit too much. Um, the second half, this is from a recipe book to make cream cheese in case you want to give it a go. And this particular example has 99% agreement. The average agreement is, is now a bit closer to 96%, which is on par with a lot of OCR for print. But I should say um, agreement and accuracy are not the same thing. So our users may agree about a particular reading, but that does not mean that that is an accurate reading. Having said that, it often is. So um, I'm, not, I'm not particularly uh, worried about that distinction, but I just wanted to be, to be clear that there's a difference. Um, and I mentioned before that we try to indicate to people when some work has been done. So in this case, the gray dots are indicating where a line or a section of a line, because in Shakespeare's world, you can do as little as a word, if you like, or just the whatever you can read. Um, so that means this is effectively retired. If you tried to place your dots there, it would urge you on to another part of the page where there are no dots, or to say you can choose a new page at any time. Um, so that's, I think, making our process seem slower, but I think we're getting much more data and probably more accurate data in the long run, which is um, good. And I said earlier in the talk that the Zooniverse is composed of both bespoke projects, which allow us to um, take some risks. You know, I think we're quite open with our research partners that it's all an adventure and an experiment. And, and I'm really glad to say that um, we've gotten a big grant from the Institute of Museum of, and sorry, Institute of Museum and Library Services in the U.S to fund um, building out free text and audio transcription tools on the project builder. We've got something that's ready to go for text transcription, and if there's anybody in the room who wants us to enable that as sort of a beta feature at the moment, um, we'd be happy to do that for you. Just send me an email. But equally, um, if you wait a little bit longer, there will be more bells and whistles and a bit more customization in terms of what you can do for the look and feel of the project. Um, they, they won't probably look as swish as annotator Shakespeare's world, if you allow that they look swish in the first place, um, but it will let you get the job done. Um, and I think that the note that I want to, to wrap up on is crowdsourcing transcription and other forms of crowdsourcing are powerful and marvelous things. And engaging with members of the public, whoever they may be, is also a powerful and wonderful thing. But I think if we're still doing things in three to five years, in the same way we're doing them now, we have failed our volunteers and we failed ourselves as uh, researchers and as institutions and research groups because I think we need to be moving in the direction that we were hearing about this morning. I was really excited to hear about that work in handwriting recognition technology and other things of that ilk. Um, this is, I think, I don't want to call it flash in the pan because um, it's been you know about 10 years, but. Um, I think you know this is a really important building block, and we should embrace it. But it's not for forever. Um, so yes, that's probably enough. And you probably all need a beverage. Right. Thank you. <laughs>